Greetings. In the previous video, um, I had uh, outlined the different approaches to dealing with the Great Depression. These approaches are going to be different based on Herbert Hoover and Franklin Roosevelt. And one thing that we established was the idea of the New Deal. And that was Franklin Roosevelt's attempt to restore the American economy, or at least get it up and running on its feet again. Now, for reasons that we're not going to get into right now, that, that never really happens. There's unemployment before Franklin Roosevelt, and there's going to be unemployment right up until 1941 when the Japanese bomb us and launch us into World War II. What I want to emphasize right now is how the, the New Deal is really going to change life in America, change American society in ways we're still dealing with these changes. The New Deal is still very much relevant in our day-to-day -day life, right? But we left off the last time talking about Franklin Roosevelt's re-election, and he's going to win a massive landslide of a, of a, of a re-election, and it's going to really kind of look like he's bulletproof. He's anything but. Um, Roosevelt's not alone in the sense that second terms don't generally start off too well. Um, but he is going to, he's, he's, he's going to start off on a pretty rough foot. One of the institutions that really did not make Franklin Roosevelt's best friend forever list was the Supreme Court. Keep in mind, in 1935, um, it, uh, it had basically uh, knocked down the New Deal. And it's out of the first New Deal that Roosevelt would establish what he would later call the Second New Deal. And Roosevelt wanted to ensure that the Second New Deal would stand the test of time, including that of the Supreme Court. The only problem was the Supreme Court is not something that you can manipulate all that easily. And that's what the Founding Fathers you know, wanted when they established it. The only way that you can get rid of a Supreme Court justice is when one retires voluntarily or dies in office, right? They serve lifetime appointments, and they're not even voted for. You've got presidents that appoint them. What Roosevelt wanted to do was to ensure that the Supreme Court could not touch his New Deal again, and so he was threatening to introduce legislation that would have essentially allowed um, him to appoint a new Supreme Court justice for every current Supreme Court justice that was already serving at or beyond the age of 70, right? So if you've got three people that are 70 or above, Roosevelt would be able to appoint three more Supreme Court justices. His critics had an absolute field day with this. He's a dictator. He thinks he's above the rule of law. He's simply trying to pack the Supreme Court. As a matter of fact, as it becomes more and more of a scandal, more and more people are calling it the court packing crisis because it's pretty clear what Roosevelt's trying to do is pack the Supreme Court with his own supporters who would protect the New Deal. Roosevelt's going to lose this battle, right? He never introduces this legislation and it's certainly going to come with some baggage, right? It's not going to do him a lot of favors, politically speaking, but it is going to send a very serious warning to the Supreme Court. Don't get in the way of the Second New Deal. Now, there were people that were banking on the idea that there would be elements of the Second New Deal deemed unconstitutional, similar to how the First New Deal was. But what the Supreme Court says in the aftermath of this crisis, you've scared us, you've terrified us, and we're not even going to touch anything that even remotely connects with the New Deal, ever, never. It's not going to happen, right? So you might think of it this way, that Roosevelt had lost the battle of the court packing crisis, but overall he won the war in the sense that the Supreme Court never, never deemed any other element of his New Deal unconstitutional. But there's still other challenges out there. Roosevelt was not this free-spending, you know, Santa Claus of a uh, politician the way that some people like to paint him. If anything, he's garnered a lot of criticism on the left considering they think he did not spend enough, that he needed to spend more. And essentially, they point to the example of World War II. That's what finally lifted us out of the Great Depression. I mean, he was forced to spend money on aircraft carriers and bombs and bullets, and you get the idea, right? 
But in 1937, Roosevelt feels that we're out of the woods. 36 was a very good year. I could finally back away from this spending, this pump priming, and he does, only to have the economy fall back on its face. We're nowhere near out of the woods. We're in Recessionville. Only this time it's Roosevelt, not Hoover, that's in the White House. And that's why this economic downturn is typically referred to as the Roosevelt Recession. He's taking more political heat for this. But the big deal is going to come that following year, 1938. Roosevelt felt that there were certain conservative elements of the Democratic Party that was holding the New Deal back. Many of these obstacles, if you will, are located in the American South. And so what he does in North Carolina, in Virginia, is he begins to run New Deal senators in these midterm elections. He tries to purge the Democratic Party of some of its more conservative elements, get rid of them, basically. It blows up in his face. The purge doesn't work. Not only do these senators and congressmen survive, but in the midst of their survival, they team up with Republicans to pretty much put an end to the New Deal. By 1939, by, for all intents and purposes, the New Deal's out of steam. You don't see that alphabet soup, that flurry of legislation that we were talking about the last time we met. That's done. But what I do want to emphasize is that the New Deal is going to make a very profound impact on American life here, and it's going to begin with organized labor. The Wagner Act essentially made it legal for unions to, to, to be formed and force their bosses, their employers, to recognize them and bargain in good faith with them, right? Now, we'd seen organized labor in this class before. We've seen the establishment of craft unionism. But as I said all those lectures ago, in order to be in that union, you had to be a craftsman, which only represented maybe a sliver of the American working class public, right? Along comes this guy that you're looking at, if you're following on the PowerPoint with me. He looks like he's got a big caterpillar crawling across his face. That's John L. Lewis. And John L. Lewis is the president of the United Mine Workers Union. Very powerful, well-organized union in American life at the time. And Lewis has this really creative idea. Let's forget about organizing based on exactly what you do for the company. Um, I don't care if you're a carpenter, if you're a pipe fitter, it doesn't matter to me if you're a janitor. Um, if you work in U.S. steel, you're essentially a steel worker. And so we're going to have these industry by industry unions, not craft unions. It doesn't matter what you do. Everything from a janitor right up to a skilled electrician, they would be unionized by the United Steel Workers Union. His approach is going to come to be known as industrial unionism. But what I want you to understand about industrial unionism is much like the old Knights of Labor, it was very inclusive. Let's bring unionism to the basic industries of the United States. Steel, auto, your con uh, construction, that sort of thing, right? John L. Lewis is going to be instrumental in the foundation of the Congress of Industrial Organizations, what comes to be known as the CIO. In 1935, he is going to reject the craft unionism that has really been in place for dozens of years. He's going to reject organizing workers based on what craft they did, and he's going to offer unionism to skilled workers and unskilled workers alike. That's what I mean when I, when I say inclusive. He doesn't care what you do. You, you can be the most skilled worker in the shop, or you can be the guy like Jurgis Rudkus that's shoveling guts. Everybody is going to be organized by these industrial unions, right? Now, what oftentimes gets lost in this shuffle, as far as unionism and the CIO is concerned, is that they're also an outlet for civil rights. Why? Well, think about who's working in the factory, right? Who's working in the factory? Are these people that were born in the United States, that are middle-class Americans, that speak the English language? No, they're not. They're people that are immigrants, or the, the, at the least they're of immigrant stock, right? Uh, many of them don't speak English as their first language. They're religious minorities. They're ethnic minorities. They're racial minorities. Many of them are women. 
And if you want them to give you some of their hard-earned money in the form of union dues, then you better produce a contract that says if you uh, are, 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 are qualified, if you're a good worker, then it's the best man or woman for the job that gets that promotion. Hiring would be based on merit, not on race. This is what I mean when I say that they're an outlet for civil rights, right? Um, it doesn't just stop there. It's, it's also seen throughout these communities. A good example as to what I'm talking about, you're going to see in the city of Detroit. One of the things that unions attempted to do to, to mobilize support for them to form in the first place is they would sponsor bowling tournaments. The only problem is bowling alleys in the city of Detroit were highly segregated, and it's going to be the union that really brings pressure. If you're not going to allow all of our members to, uh, to, to bowl black and white alike, then none of us will bowl and you'll lose money. It's the unions that really lift this ugly stain of Jim Crow in the, in the institution of American bowling. But there's dozens of other examples that, that, that do combine unionism with the outlet for civil rights. At the most basic of levels, guys, what this is would be a voice for workers, considering this is a huge demographic of American voters, and these individuals are generally going to support Franklin Roosevelt, right? Now, it's one thing to have a Wagner Act, and it's another thing to really have that law followed. The CEO of General Motors, one of the biggest, most powerful corporations in the world, a guy by the name of Alfred Sloan, had been advised that the Supreme Court was days away from knocking down the Wagner Act, deeming it to be unconstitutional. So he didn't allow workers to form unions. He fired those people that were trying to form unions, and, and he promised that he would never recognize, let alone bargain collectively with any union. I want you to think about what has happened every time in this class that we've seen attempts to form unions. They walk out of the factory, they fight with the police force, the police force breaks them, and then the police escort replacement workers back in and the factory starts cranking out whatever it is that we're talking about. You saw it time and time again, right? So if you're a worker, one thing that you might want to consider not doing is leaving the factory. And that's what those guys are doing right there in that factory, that General Motors factory in Flint, Michigan. They're sitting down. Now, this is a very dramatic thing to do, what will come to be known as the sit-down strike, but it's also a really good strategy. They're locking themselves inside the factory, and they're saying, we're not going to work, and we're also not going to come out until you give us what the federal government says that we have a right to have, and that's a union. You recognize the union, and we'll go back to work. Don't recognize the union, and Ford, Dodge, everybody else is going to eat your lunch. It's that simple. Now, try as they might, um, the, the corporation cannot evict those workers, right? Um, they, they tried everything from blasting the heat to turning off the heat to trying to have the police storm the building and evict them forcibly. Nothing worked, right? And in the process, what Sloan tried to do was the same thing that worked for Carnegie, the same thing that worked for Pullman. He tried to get Franklin Roosevelt to break apart the strike. What those workers are doing are illegally occupying my property, and I want you to get in there and protect my property, right? Franklin Roosevelt did mobilize the Federal National Guards, and what those guards did is stand in between the private police force that was trying to evict the workers and the factory. In other words, what FDR is saying is, I'm not going to do your dirty work. W what worked for, you know, uh, George Pullman is not going to work for you, Sloan. You're going to need to do some of that labor management relations stuff, right? And what happened was General Motors was brought to its knees. It, it is forced to recognize the union in 1937 in, in what comes to be known as the sit-down strike. And this is going to have a massive tidal wave of an effect on the American economy. I mean, it's so powerful that a massive corporation like U.S. Steel, rather than to face a, a sit-down strike, simply capitulated and, and recognized the union before the steel workers even had a chance to strike that facility. 
it's a monumental development in American economic history because now all of a sudden the game had changed. And when these industries, company by company, began to recognize the union, for the first time in American history, what we see happening here is the emergence of a blue-collared middle class. For the first time in American history, where you see workers that are going to begin to make middle class money and get some of the protections and the securities that only the middle class had known up until this point. As, as one auto worker is famously quoted in saying, Franklin Roosevelt was the first president in American history that understood that my boss was a bastard, right? And so, again, his support in this whole strike process is going to win him millions of, of supporters in, in the American working class. Another impact that the New Deal is going to have is for American women. Um, Franklin Roosevelt would really diversify his administration and he's going to bring new people into politics, including women, right? It's going to be Franklin Roosevelt that will be the first president to ever appoint a woman into his cabinet. And that would be uh, 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 Frances Perkins, the lady that you see at the top of the screen there with the, with the glasses on examining those papers. And um, she is going to be the first uh, uh, secretary of labor, a very important post in and of itself. But she's going to be instrumental in the design of, uh, of, 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 of the Wagner Act, the, 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 the law that gives workers the right to form unions in the first place. He is going to select Molly Dusen to be the women's division chairperson of the Democratic National Committee. And what Dusen's going to do is she's going to develop a, this idea of the reporter plan, which is going to commission American women to go out there and report to other American women voters what the New Deal is doing, where we're going in terms of goals, the progress that we've made so far. It's going to mobilize millions and millions of American ladies when it comes to their involvement in, in politics. One of my favorites is that lady that you're looking at in the bottom right corner of the screen there. That would be Mary McLeod Bethune, who Roosevelt is going to appoint as the Negro Affairs Division uh, chair for the National Youth Administration. In a way, Roosevelt is, is diversifying his presidency and bringing people of color into positions of power where they have access to the White House. This is really for the first time in American history. And you can understand how and why this appointment would demonstrate to people of the African-American variety that maybe the time is right for a change. Maybe we need to abandon the party of Lincoln and really begin to embrace the Democratic Party, considering some of the appointments that Franklin Roosevelt is making. But if you want the gold standard when it comes to women in politics, look no further than the First Lady. Eleanor Roosevelt is going to really define this new wave of women in politics. In so many ways, ER, as I'll call her, is really going to define what you and I think of as a First Lady in the modern sense of the term First Lady. Unlike people like Mary Todd Lincoln, no, no disrespect to Lincoln, but she's not going to redecorate a White House or something like that. She had a nationally syndicated column that appeared in newspapers all across the country that was called My Day. And in her column, she took on very controversial issues, child care and women in the workforce. These were controversial issues at the time, and Roosevelt did not back down. She got behind things like uh, the Costigan-Wagner bill, which was an attempt to make lynching, the, the act of vigilante violence that was typically aimed at people of color, especially African Americans, made that a federal crime. Now, ultimately, this never comes to fruition, but the, the mere fact that Roosevelt, and, and Eleanor Roosevelt in particular, was on the record when it comes to their support of civil rights is yet another reason why African Americans begin to gravitate toward the Democratic Party. 
She was also a very outspoken pacifist throughout her time as the First Lady, uh, believed deeply in peace, uh, and, and, and really rejected these, these calls to get involved in foreign affairs when it comes to war. But the major campaign that I'd like you to associate with ER would come to be known as Arthurdale, West Virginia. One of the people that would become a lifelong friend of ER was the lady that's uh, looking down next to her there. That was the newspaper reporter, a woman by the name of Lorraine Hickok. And she covered ER um, in her time as the First Lady, reported directly with her, about her, um, all of these things, right? And one of the things that ER and Hick, as Eleanor Roosevelt used to call her, one of the things that they did is they went on this nationwide tour to really see with their own eyes the suffering of the American people. And as far as they were concerned, nowhere did it get any worse than West Virginia. Um, the main industry, coal mining, had been absolutely ravaged by the Great Depression. And each night there were children that laid down in these bug-infested shacks, really shanties, um, that did not have enough food to eat. And this was heartbreaking as far as she was concerned. And so when she got back to Washington, um, she and she, she, had, she had really sent uh, Lorena Hickok out and then the two went on this tour together, but it was Hickok that reported how bad things were in West Virginia. Eleanor Roosevelt, upon seeing this with her own eyes, is going to design uh, what you and I would probably call public housing projects. Uh, we've got a very different definition of what the term projects means, but in the case of Arthur Dale, what this was was government-built housing for people that could not afford housing in their own right. It was not welfare. It was not charity. What Arthur Dale became was a scenario where the government provided the housing and then workers would be given this job and a sizable chunk of their paycheck would go toward paying off the home. So in a way, it, it wasn't necessarily government assistance as much as it was government-initiated housing that would eventually be paid back out of the paychecks of American workers. And that becomes the central project of, uh, of Eleanor Roosevelt as her time as the First Lady. It's pretty controversial, and she took a lot of heat uh, from, 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 from people that did not believe in what she was doing. But Arthur Dale was to Eleanor Roosevelt what Warm Springs was to FDR. It was her life's work, and it absolutely was her passion. Back to the New Deal. Um, this is going to have a monumental impact on the future of American life, and, and it really doesn't get any more direct than, than what a lot of historians will tell you. The uh, democratization, making America more small d democratic um, throughout the 1930s and 1940s. One example that you can point to directly here would be the Work Progress Administration. These were these government uh, public works projects that I was telling you about. Um, it was bridges, it was roads, it was schools. Um, in, in, in Texas, one of the things that you see is the uh, the addition of shoulders on roads and rest stops and these massive Texas highways, especially in the western part of the state, right? But unlike previous administrations who had operated in a semi-racist sort of way, um, the Works Progress Administration was an equal opportunity employer. African Americans in the 1930s only represented about 11% of the population, but they qualified for over 33% of the jobs that ultimately were doled out uh, under the WPA. What I think that that demonstrates is that Roosevelt understood the idea that when the Great Depression hit, it really hammered people of color, considering they were typically the first fired and the last hired, right? The idea that he understood and, and actually awarded over a third of the WPA jobs to people in the black community demonstrates that idea that he gets it, right? 
But with more relief to go around, some of those vicious deportation campaigns that we were talking about in the earlier part of the 30s, they ended. Native Americans uh, see some democracy headed their way. In 1934, you see the Indian Reorganization Act, which is going to lift one of the nastiest, ugliest, most racist laws in American history, that'd be the Dawes Act. Um, even though 1943 is outside of our general parameter when it comes to the New Deal, Asian Americans benefit. We're going to lift another ugly, nasty, racist law. We will undo the Chinese Exclusion Act. 1934, the Tiding McDuffie Act would grant independence to the Philippines. Uh, it's a little bit outside of uh, domestic policy, but still, it's bringing democracy to the United States, where it's more democratic after the um, uh, New Deal than before it. One thing that I'd like to emphasize with you in the time that we have remaining is the ecological impact of the New Deal. One of the things that's going to define the 1930s is this ecological, this environmental disaster known as the Dust Bowl. Very, very dry time period in the southwestern part of the United States. Um, what had happened was farmers with these brand new tractors that were motorized uh, could plow more land. And because they we're not getting the same amount of price, same amount of profit from, from, their, from their output as they were during the war years, World War I. What that means in the world of farmers is you go, you produce more corn, you produce more wheat, you produce more soy, whatever it is that you're producing. What you're doing when you're tilling up the earth is you're exposing the soil to the elements, including the sun, which is not that big of a deal if you're getting precipitation, but when you get drought, it's going to sap the soil, it's going to turn it into silt, into dust, and when the wind picks up, it's going to blow it every which way. If you're looking at some of those images there, those are very famous images taken uh, during the New Deal. Um, as a matter of fact, some of them were, were paid, the, some of them were taken by photographers paid to go out there by the federal government and chronicle the, the the ecological disaster, they demonstrate um, what a crisis you're, you're actually seeing in the Southwest. But not even the president can really control the weather. This crisis that we're talking about here is known as the Dust Bowl. Um, it's called the Dust Bowl because when the wind picked up, you would have these dust clouds, these dust storms that would literally block out the sun. It had a health risk to it. It was known as dust pneumonia, but generally speaking, what you're talking about is choking on mud. You're breathing all that dusty air in, and it's collapsing your lungs, right? Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal's response to the Dust Bowl is going to be the Civilian Conservation Corps, right? The CCC. What the CCC is going to do is it's going to employ young people, right? High school, early college age students. And what it's going to do is it's going to bring a military regimentation, a very hard work ethic, to these people up early, in bed late. A part of their paycheck was mandated to go back to their families, so it's forced savings. But the work that it's going to sponsor is the planting of trees. It's the keeping of the environment, right? Now, why plant trees? Well, on the one hand, what trees produce is oxygen. And on the other hand, what they do is they keep the soil in one place. By keeping the soil in one place, you're at least addressing this whole issue known as the Dust Bowl. And so no, this doesn't have some sort of magic solution to it, but on the one hand, it's addressing a clear-cut problem, the Dust Bowl, and at the same time, it's paying people to go out there and do things like plant trees and, and, and putting money into people's hands to try to get the American economy humming once again, okay? But the Dust Bowl is a good example of the New Deal going green, so to speak. Um, the impact of all of this. As I said before, there is going to be a transition in American political life whereby the Democratic Party is going to become the dominant party in American politics. New voters are beginning to embrace the Democratic Party, and a lot of times they're not exactly, you know, the more likely of political allies. But this democratic dominance that's going to come to be known as the New Deal Coalition 
uh, an inter-alliance of American voters, all of whom are going to support the Democratic Party. Massive Democratic uh, uh, coalition of voters, big D Democratic coalition of voters. What they're going to do is they're going to make the Democratic Party the, the more dominant party for the next 30 some odd years. I mean, it's not really going to be until 1968, I mean, not really, until 1968 that Republicans are going to have a really legitimate chance to compete on a level playing field. It's this, it's this much of a dominating force. And so this is going to help to explain what is going to come next in American history when it comes to some of the programs, the policies, and uh, campaigns that will emerge in the late 1930s and into the war years. And that's where we'll pick it up the next time I meet.